Thank you very much, Dan. It's, uh, it's, it's sort of fitting to be able to talk about this in um, Turning Point Space. I did a lot of work on Meloxone in my time here and um, yeah, so it's interesting how things have developed over time. Um, before I begin, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land um, and their elders past and um, present and um, yeah, and begin by um, yeah, acknowledging my other um, co-author here, Simon Lenton, who um, has played in this space for the um, sort of same amount of time as myself. And um, I <coughs> just wanted to say at the outset that I've got a range of slides here. I've got something like 45 slides to try and get through. And um, I was thinking about how to frame the talk by you know, just seeing who the audience actually was rather than um, having it all pre-planned. So I'm going to skip over some to come to the end to talk a lot about the Victorian situation in particular, just looking at around it um, who's here. Um, but if there's any questions or anything like that, please um, bring them up as we're going along. So, and I should point out that I'm not standing, um, I'm sitting, even though I was instructed to stand because um, I've got a calf injury and I, I just, the idea of standing for an hour was a bit, a bit much. And also the last time I was in front of lights like these was at a press conference after a, um, after a 100k bike ride and I sweated like absolute crazy. And um, it was very amusing watching um, people's reaction when it was on TV later that night. And I have a feeling I'm going to be sweating a bit under these lights again too. So, well, my, and you know, without hair you can't kind of hide it. Um, anyway, so today talking about um, the wider distribution of naloxone. Um, for those of you who don't know what naloxone is, I imagine that most people here would know. It's an opioid um, antagonist, so it's a reversal medication that's very effective. Um, it's been used widely in emergency medicine for a long period. It's also used in um, anaesthetology. Um, it can be administered in a variety of different ways. It's traditionally um, started out being administered intravenously, um, but it's also um, can be administered intramuscularly, intranasally and subcutaneously. Um, and Melbourne's fortunate in that, well fortunate, Melbourne um, has a history in relation to the wider distribution of naloxone because it was at a conference here in 1993 that John Strang um, first mooted the idea of distributing this drug more widely to people who use opioids. And um, it was the harm reduction conference here and he kind of he kind of made the, made the, um, the call off the cuff. And um, so Australia did actually play quite a role in relation to naloxone distribution and the wider distribution of naloxone and we'll come to see how that played out um, during the course of the talk. Um, in the mid-1990s, in response to his claim, some people just got on, ahead, got on with it and did it, especially in parts of Europe. So in Italy, for example, it's been available over the counter since 1995. Um, but in 2000, given the state of the evidence at the time, um, Simon Lenton and Kim Hargraves, on the basis of some work that was funded by um, the Victorian government, made a recommendation that we should move to a randomised controlled trial of making naloxone available to peers. And um, the unit of randomisation was going to be states, so some states would have naloxone and other states wouldn't, and um, so on. So there was, there was moves afoot to um, pretty early on in the whole naloxone piece to try and really establish an evidence base. Just um, quickly, in relation to um, what it does, I mean, basically, it's it, it, it has such an affinity to the opioid receptors in the brain that if there's opioids in there, such as heroin or its metabolites, then um, basically naloxone is so, um, it has such an affinity to the receptors that it comes in and just knocks that um, opioid straight out of the receptors. And in particular, the respiratory centre, the pons, which is um, affected by opioids, um, it, it works in that, in that region. And it's those, um, it's the breathing centres in that region of the brain that are fundamentally important in, in this equation. So to knock the opioids out of that system um, means that people can start breathing again. And the big problem around opioid overdose is around breathing. That's what's central. So um, typically what happens if someone overdoses is that they go into a respiratory arrest, so they stop breathing, and then eventually that leads to a cardiac arrest and brain, and brain death. And even when you're in um, poor respiration, you can have all sorts of consequences such as, um, you know, um, hypoxic brain injury and so forth. It's really important to avoid if you possibly can. Um, we know that um, there's a variety of behaviours that are really important in relation to um, opioid overdose. We know that the majority of overdoses are indeed accidental. 
Um, you know, while there is quite a few people who do try and um, commit suicide as a result of um, you know various um, sort of life issues and so forth, most overdoses that we come across are accidental. Um, mostly it is older people who are at risk, not young people, so the idea of it being a result of the first hit, the first hit that a 16-year-old you know, teenager has at a party or something like that, is, um, has been debunked for some, for some time. We know that pharmacotherapy such as methadone and buprenorphine is protective. Um, we know that benzodiazepines and alcohol play a really key role in relation to opioid overdoses. So. Um, at the moment, as I understand it, there's very, very few um, heroin overdoses, for example, that are just heroin alone, very few. I mean, it used to be there was up around about 30, 40 percent, but I think that number's even come down further now. And so it's really alcohol in particular, and the, the, we don't actually understand very well about what the sequencing is in relation to alcohol, so whether or not it's people sort of coming out of prison, for example, um, you know, um, going and getting drunk, and then as a consequence, they're um, you know, they, uh, they um, might then go and have a hit of heroin or something like that, and that might be the sequence in which it occurs, or alternatively, they might have heroin and then have alcohol. We don't understand that yet. Um, we know that, you know, if people have been in some kind of um, abstinence-based treatment or if they've been in custody where they haven't been able to use um, opioids, then their tolerance changes and therefore they have an increased overdose risk, and we know that um, changes in drug dose related to tolerance also has um, some impact there as well. Um, there's a clear opportunity to prevent deaths. We know that in most cases there's someone else around. Um, we know that um, most of the times the death doesn't occur until sometime after the injection. Usually it's well over an hour and sometimes up to four hours. Um, and while there is some indication that people are more willing to call ambulances these days, that um, you know Deborah Kerr in Victoria has actually shown, um, you know, in typically we see that only in around 50 to 60 percent of cases are ambulances called in relation to fatal overdoses, of course. Um, and we know we can do some things about it. So the first thing that we can do is to increase pharmacotherapy access. We know that that works to prevent overdoses and we know that in particular if we can manage systems such as when people coming out of prison, if they're on pharmacotherapy, if they can get their pharmacotherapy after prison and so forth, that has a really fundamental impact on overdose fatalities. We know that safe injecting facilities work to prevent overdoses. In, at least in terms of fatal overdoses, because the people can um, respond to the fatal overdose almost immediately. Um, we know that um, protocols between police and um, ambulance in particular are um, useful in you know, allowing people um, sort of the space to actually call ambulances. So um, in the um, late 90s there was a protocol introduced in Victoria whereby the police said they wouldn't routinely attend overdoses and that had a um, big impact on the um, way in which people um, would respond to overdoses. We know that training in overdose management um, can um, increase um, access to appropriate responses. And as I said, there are some signs of encourage, encouraging signs of improved responding in, evident in um, Deborah Kerr's work. In terms of the um, wider distribution of naloxone, so basically Strang's call was to say, well, it's been used in emergency medicine. Why aren't we giving it to the people who are going to be around people who are experiencing overdoses? So that's typically peers family members and so forth, because it's, it doesn't take much to administer. You don't really need that much training. Um, uh, but various people have raised issues with it along the way. And I guess the most fundamental one is to make sure that you don't confuse it with naltrexone. There's a lot of conflation with um, confusing with naltrexone at the moment. Naltrexone is a longer acting opioid antagonist. And um, while it would be effective in relation to overdose um, reversal, it is used as a relapse prevention medication. It's not to be, it's not used in emergency um, practice. Um, safety, really there's very little um, in terms of this drug that is unsafe in the sense that if someone doesn't have opioids on board, the drug has virtually no impact whatsoever. It'd probably have a little bit of impact on people who are alcohol dependent, but really it is um, one of the um, safer drugs that's out there that has a really clear um, has a really clear um, mechanism of action. 
Um, things like, well, I mentioned that there's alcohol and benzodiazepines on board, and so you know most overdoses are going to involve poly drug use. Um, but really, the problem of overdoses is, as I said, this breathing impact, and it's the opioid that's having that effect. And so, if you remove the effect of the opioid, then um, it's going to work. There's things like um, people have said, well, if everyone is around the person and they're all stoned, how are they going to be able to administer it properly? But really, it, it's, as I said, it's not rocket science to administer it, especially if you, um, you know, um, receive appropriate training. And it is simpler than a lot of other in interventions that are out there. And most of the other things, there's um, no evidence to support them. There's a little bit of evidence to suggest that um, it might delay people from calling an ambulance if you've given naloxone out to them to be used in um, response to overdose. Um, <coughs> now, Let's turn quickly to have a think about the situation in Australia. So this is the number of opioid related deaths in Australia that were extracted from um, some work uh, being done at the National Drug and Alcohol Research Centre. And the big hump in the middle there, the heroin glut, that had a huge impact on the way in which we started to think about opioid overdose. So most of those overdoses involved heroin. and. You can see that there was over a thousand there in 1999, 360 odd of those were in um, Victoria, most of them were in Melbourne. At that time Melbourne had the highest rate of um, heroin overdose in the country, higher than Sydney, which shocked some of the people from Sydney. But then you can see that precipitous decline at the end of 2000 <coughs> into early 2001 that had a major impact on the way that we started thinking about it. So the Herald Sun, which used to run the heroin toll versus the road toll, um, no longer, um, after a while, stopped doing that because the um, heroin toll was under the road toll and so they couldn't sensationalise it anymore. But really the whole thing of opioid overdose went off the agenda and it was partly um, you know, partly the, um, the lack of effort on um, the part of people such as myself to keep it on the agenda because, you know, the fact that there's not a thousand people dying, there's still 400 people dying and they're all dying unnecessarily. None of these people need to die. Um, so as a consequence, um, you know, the, the, the um, interest sort of dissipated a bit. And here is the part of the reason why there's been so many developments in the United States, which you'll see in a minute. So overdose rates related to opioids in the United States have increased dramatically over time. And you can see um, you know, the, the increase is um, exponential there. And you can see that um, over the main increase at the end of that series, the Australian rate was pretty flat. But the Australian rate is starting to increase again. And the most recent data suggests that that increase is, in, is continuing again. But unlike what's happened in the US, where a lot of those US deaths are um, for people who aren't injecting the opioids, they're taking them orally. Um, it's still the case that in um, the majority, by far the majority of the opioid related deaths in, um, in Australia are occurring amongst people who inject drugs. And that again um, highlights the opportunity for some of our naloxone programs or some of the ways in which we could access people who would benefit from naloxone. I mentioned the US as a special case. So the US has really seen the widest, um, the widest publicity anyway in terms of um, the implementation of the wider distribution of naloxone and it's the Chicago Recovery Alliance down there that has led the, um, you can see the acronym that they've come up with there for their program is called SCAREME. So stimu stimulation, call for help, airway, rescue breathing, evaluate, muscular injection of naloxone and evaluate and support. So they were really um, the leaders in many respects. And um, John Strang was saying just the other day about how he was embarrassed to um, have Dan Big from the Chicago Reto Recovery Alliance come up to him at a conference after he kept talking about um, giving out naloxone to people. And he said, you know, when are you actually going to start doing it as opposed to talking about it? And in the meantime, Chicago Recovery Alliance had actually been doing it for some time. Um, <coughs> So in terms of the ways in which people have gone about doing it so far, it's typically been in, the, in, 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 um, in uh, thinking through a uh, mechanism of training people up. Often it's going to be um, in a harm reduction style organisation where training will take place. 
and then um, at the end of that training, making some kind of assessment of how well the person um, is going to be capable of responding and then giving them naloxone um, if they feel that the person is capable of responding. And so there's a, and, and these sorts of programs have been implemented in a variety of different settings with um, a different um, variety of different materials, most of which are available online. So there's nothing, um, there's nothing copyrighted around any of this sort of stuff as yet. Um, and these are the typical components, which if you have a look at them and you're familiar with our normal overdose education practices, most of these things are covered in a lot of the overdose education that goes on. So, you know, things, the importance of airway maintenance and rescue breathing. Rescue breathing is the fundamental thing because, as I said, it's not a, it's not a um, problem of cardiac arrest, it's a problem of respiratory arrest, so people aren't breathing. And um, all of those sorts of things are uh, common to most of these programs. Um, and uh, Eliza Wheeler and other people from the um, Harm Reduction Coalition um, conducted an online survey of all of these programs that they possibly could get access to. And um, this was just for the USA, sorry. And you can see that there's around about six, you know, 188 programs at that time across 16 different states. 53,000 naloxone kits had been dispensed with around about 10,000 overdose reversals having been reported. Um, and importantly, there's a variety of different ways in which the naloxone preparations have been distributed. So some involve um, single ampules that are uh, given. Um, some involve um, a, a larger ampule that can have multiple doses withdrawn from it at once. And some of them involve um, the um, pre-filled syringes that are known as mini jets. Um, and in some of those states, the naloxone that's distributed is, is distributed in a way that you can administer it intranasally. So you put an atomizer on the end of the device, like the one in the photo just there, that little white <coughs> thing there. You put that on the, the end of the lower lock syringe and then you um, just depress the, the um, plunger and, and it um, atomizes. And um, we've shown in other studies that um, intranasal naloxone works basically as well as intramuscular naloxone. So, you know, there's a variety of different programs that have been implemented. Um, this is just an example of one that was that's um, running in the US. The important thing to note there is the length of the training. So they're only running at about 10, to, uh, 10 minutes to half an hour of training for people before they get the script. Um, and importantly, it's, it's worth noting there's a variety of different concentrations of the drug that are being implemented in these sorts of programs. So in this one, it was um, one milligram of naloxone per mil of, um, of um, fluid. And um, that varies across different um, programs. So in the UK, for example, it's 400 <coughs> micrograms in one mil or, um, you know, and it's worth noting that the ambulance dose that's given, sorry, the dose that's used in ambulance practice here is still two milligrams in five mil, as I understand it. Um, just to highlight the um, fact that New York State has a um, you know, large number of dif um, distribution sites, 62 different programs. Boston has a really large program that's um, been um, replicated right across Massachusetts. Um, in particular, there's this focus on um, people who are in methadone maintenance or have recently been in methadone um, treatment of some, des some description. And you can see that um, you know, there's large numbers of people who have been um, treated, uh, have been put through these programs. Um, programs have been operating in all of these different countries and um, you know, places where you mightn't necessarily expect to be more advanced in a country like Australia, such as um, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan and Vietnam. Um, just in the interest of time, I think I'll, I'll skip over these um, slides pretty quickly, but just basically these, this, this body of work led by Strang and others has shown that um, when you train people in overdose management response and naloxone administration, not surprisingly, you get an inf impact. So if you train someone how to respond to an overdose, then they feel more comfortable in responding to overdoses. If you train someone in naloxone administration and, about, and what naloxone is about, not surprisingly, they um, are able to report what naloxone should be used for um, more effectively. Um, one of the key concerns that people have about naloxone is that it's a short-acting drug. Typically, the effects wear off 
within half an hour. And um, so there's the potential for opioids which have longer half-lives, like heroin, for example, um, for, you know, so when the naloxone wears off, the heroin kicks back on in and they go into overdose. So there's been some studies that have looked into um, whether or not people have been administered naloxone through the emergency system, such as ambulances or emergency departments. So they've looked at um, whether or not once they've been administered the drug, do they then go into reintoxication and then die or something like that? And um, you know, these these various studies have shown um, in the US that the, that hasn't happened. Um, we did a similar kind of study, which we never published, back in um, must have been 2000 or thereabouts, and um, again showed that um, virtually no one had um, uh, dropped again after being administered naloxone in the, um, by an ambulance. Um, paramedic. But um, there was two cases where that did happen um, and the person did actually die but there was good evidence that that occurred a long time after the ambulance attendance and um, the person must have gone and gotten another, um, another hit of heroin in that time. So um, really it's pretty, it's pretty basic, it's basically been established um, pretty comfortably that um, the risks of reintoxication aren't, um, aren't particularly Problematic. The bigger issue is making sure that someone is, um, you know, properly informed about what the risks are afterwards. Anyway, um, there's also some interesting, uh, interesting evidence around whether or not these sort of um, programs actually just empower people to start taking care of their own lives a bit more and so forth. And there's some good evidence. Um, from um, the US to suggest that that's actually the case and some of the people in the ACT program that I'm um, going to be describing to you shortly, they actually um, now sort of call themselves naloxone superheroes and things and so, you know, the, the people are empowered to take control of their own lives and their own destiny and they sort of feel pretty good about it and you can see some <laughs> quotes here that, um, that sort of summarise that, that um, position. I guess the, the most important um, thing though is if you're going to implement this wider distribution of naloxone, what sort of impact is it going to have? Is it going to work? Is it going to actually make a difference? And it is a very difficult thing to evaluate. So as I said, we originally had this idea of having a randomised control trial across Australia that um, subsequently didn't happen. But um, there's been a variety of other mechanisms by which people have tried to get um, evidence. And most of the evidence is observational. So it's not um, as strong as a randomised control trial, but um, we think that nowadays the evidence is, is um, of a reasonable quality. And so, you know, basically, as I said, there's observational studies. So, um, you know, there are people who are calling for um, randomised control trial evidence as the only thing that they would um, support in relation to this. But um, these observational studies really do have um, very few other explanations that could um, that could um, account for the findings and how consistent they are. And you know, the other point is that many of our most successful interventions were implemented in the absence of randomised control trial evidence. So needle and syringe programs and so forth, there hasn't been a um, randomised control trial um, to support those. So here's what happened in Chicago. You can see the Chicago Recovery Alliance starts their, um, their program there in um, two, 2001. And you can see that there was a decrease in the rate of um, heroin-related heroin fatalities. And it basically went stable after that time. Now, the obvious problem with that is that we had a very similar kind of um, effect in 2001 in, in, um, in Australia, as you saw before. So it's not definitive, but um, you know, according to the people who are in Chicago, they didn't have any kind of change in heroin supply or anything like that. So it's, so it's reasonably, um, you know, they suggest that that was the impact of the program. And similarly in New York, um, you know, the, after the implementation of the program, there was a decline in the number of, um, number of heroin related fatalities. But that said, again, it's not definitive. So the one way in which people have gone about looking at it is to look at whether or not there's variations in how much implementation has taken place on these programs. So Wally and others, and it's recently published in the BMJ, um, basically looked at how, um, mapped out how much um, overdose education and naloxone distribution programs have been implemented in different parts of Massachusetts. And in some places they've been implemented quite, um, quite 
um, intensively, in other places less intensively, and in other parts of the in other parts of the state they hadn't been implemented at all. And by using that, they were able to look at well, so if this if it's if we've got this varying implementation, then you would expect varying impacts on overdose rates and things like that. And so that's what they examined in this quasi-experimental design. And um, they had a variety of control conditions, so they were comparing it against things like road traffic accidents, which aren't likely to be related to overdose, uh, sorry, opioid supply and so forth. And what they showed, and the only, the, the crucial thing to, um, to um, point out here, um, the, the figures are pretty small to read, I suspect, is <coughs> that um, when in, in the absolute model at the top there, when there was no implementation, if you had low implementation, so one to 100 enrolments per um, 100,000 population, you had a significant decrease in the number of heroin-related deaths. Um, same with high implementation with greater than 100 um, enrolments, you also got this impact. And you can see that there is actually a, um, you know, a, a small indication of a dose response effect, so that once you have a low implementation, you've got um, you know, slightly um, more impact if you have a higher implementation. And that's kind of what you would expect if this was having the impact. And um, they did control for a variety of um, variables like the you know, amount of methadone prescribed in areas and all of those kinds of things. So it does give an indication of the, um, of the um, relative impact which really is probably the strongest support that we've had for this intervention yet. The problem that we have though is that it didn't quite reach statistical significance, that um, dose response effect. So that difference between 0.73 and 0.54 isn't quite statistically significant. But um, really uh, I think that it's um, reasonably close to um, supporting a um, dose response effect. Um, and you know that's one one of the um, you know Bradford Hill criteria for actually suggesting that you know there's some kind of causation going on here. But anyway, um, it wasn't quite significant. There's been some other um, studies to show how um, the distribution of naloxone to peers, in particular, is um, cost effective. I won't go into this model here, but um, you know it's been published just this year in the um, Annals of Internal Medicine by Coffin and others and um, move on to where we are in relation to Australia. So I mentioned at the start or earlier that um, you know, we were actually on the cusp of actually establishing a trial, getting something happening and um, taking the lead on this. Australia has a history of leading a lot of stuff in relation to harm reduction, but the um, heroin drought, the end of the heroin glut hit and as a consequence it went off the agenda. So it is worth pointing out that Victoria had actually allocated some money for the randomised control trial that was supposed to be run. So there was um, a significant sum of money that had been allocated and um, the plan was that all the other states would contribute and then we'd end up with a um, significant amount of uh, money that would be able to run this trial properly. But um, Victoria was the only, uh, only state that um, actually formally committed the money and then the heroin drought hit and people's um, and uh, as a consequence, things went off the uh, opioid overdose went off the radar. Um, so we now have a long history of waiting. So we haven't really um, done particularly much. And as I said, we had this um, the um, funds for the trial in Victoria, and because the trial didn't go ahead, what we was replaced with was some um, studies looking at intranasal naloxone. And as I said, we um, were able to demonstrate that intranasal naloxone is basically as effective as intramuscular naloxone. And that has important implications in relation to um, bloodborne viruses um, um, in, um, in when you're reviving people. Um, and that's continuing in the Sydney Medically Supervised Injecting Centre. But <coughs> it's sort of... Um, things bubbled away in the background and, and a lot of us had sort of diverted our attention elsewhere and then um, you know people started saying you know basically well people are still dying why on earth are we still not thinking about this kind of initiative and um, so colleagues and um, colleagues so um, Simon Lenton and, and colleagues um, put together a couple of papers for the MJA and Drug and Alcohol Review and basically we were making a call for um, the um, re-establishment of this as a priority issue. 
And um, we argue that because of this international evidence that accumulated over time, the way in which people had gone about implementing these programs and so forth, we argued basically that the time had come just to move and we didn't need a trial anymore. And then we had some really interesting um, advocacy that was done um, in the wider population by Annex and um, people in um, Canberra in particular, so this Canberra Alliance for Harm Minimisation and Advocacy, or CARMA. And um, you know, basically people started to um, respond. So this um, advocacy work in the ACT in particular was really, really important. So um, the ACT Health Minister made some initially supportive um, um, public statements around it. And then uh, really led by Nicole Wiggins um, from CARMA, um, the ANAC committee was formed and basically that brought together a whole series of different people who were involved, um, stakeholders across the kind of opioid overdose spectrum um, and included myself. Um, and the idea was basically to provide a platform for actually taking action in this area finally. And so we had a series of um, um, meetings that um, you know, happened really quickly in the end. So you know, people didn't sort of sit around and wait and you know, um, you know, form committees and, not, you know, and, and, and nothing happened or anything like that. It just went straight to, straight to the point. We did a lot of consultation. We had a, developed up a communication strategy around it. And um, by the end of 2011, um, the ACT Chief Minister, who um, happened to be that health minister, um, was actually able to launch the program and then um, the ENACT process, which I, you know, we hopefully have some time to talk about, um, moved into the implementation phase and so um, people such as myself are more involved in um, evaluation whereas the people who are actually going to be delivering the program um, were involved more in the implementation. Um, and in April 2012, um, the first training program um, was delivered by Karma. And um, as I said, some of us are involved in an independent evaluation. The um, key characteristics of it, the, the um, aims are relatively modest. It's the first um, program of its type. And so as a consequence, um, basically, we're just trying to reach 200 people in the first instance. And um, it should be pointed out that it's all been done on a lot of um, goodwill. So the budget attached to this program is, is very, very small. Um, by, by um, uh, typical standards. The focus is on peers, so friends um, of people who inject drugs, but also um, we, we're targeting Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and people who are about to be released from prison, as well as families, and families should be up there. Um, the materials that have been used have been drawn from a variety of those in online um, sources that I mentioned before. Um, the idea was to have a one hour course, the course is taking longer than that um, and that's one of the issues that we have to deal with um, over time. But at the end of the, basically what happens is people come in in a group, they're trained, um, they're given a lot of information about, um, about overdose response, they're trained in the administration of naloxone and then at the end there's an assessment and if the, um, a GP who comes along to the sessions is satisfied that the people are able to um, administer naloxone in, in their mind, then they're um, prescribed. And um, if people do use the doses, then they are given subsequent doses. And as you see up there, there's 131 people who've been through the program um, at the end of uh, July or in the middle of July. The important thing to note is that the, I should have a picture of it, but the, the pack itself actually contains five 400 microgram ampules. So um, you've got um, essentially two milligrams of naloxone um, in this pack. Um, it contains needles and syringes, gloves, a breathing mask, all sorts of things in it. It's quite a, it's quite a um, big package, but w how people are using that is, you know, a lot of people are just taking um, components of that out with them when they're going out and so forth. Um, there's, the evaluation is relatively um, modest as well. We have um, a lot of um, goodwill going on there too with Anna Olsen leading it. But basically we have pre and post training surveys that form part of the evaluation material. We're following up every program participant at six months. And if anyone does report having used the, um, the naloxone, then we um, do follow them up. Um, I don't actually have the number of reversals that have taken place, but a number of reversals have taken place. So um, 
And a lot of them actually happen pretty soon after the program is implemented. And the number of reversals, as I understand it, has actually declined a bit recently, um, which might just reflect something about the uh, mar drug market conditions and so forth. Um, ACT just beat New South Wales in terms of getting something started. So um, the peer-led um, mechanism of um, KARMA that um, I specified through the ACT program can be contrasted with the service-led um, system that's been developed up in New South Wales. So in New South Wales, there's programs running out of the Kirkton, Kirkton Road Centre in Kings Cross and the Langton Centre. And um, again, they commenced in July 2012. Um, they've had, I think, 47 people go through the program so far. So it hasn't been as, um, hasn't, um, the uptake hasn't been so, um, so large. Um, but we're very connected. So a lot of the materials are shared. A lot of the um, evaluation materials are shared and so forth. But it is um, very much run out of, the, uh, out of these two services in particular at the moment. But that may well expand. One major thing that happened while um, these recent developments have taken place is that the 400 microgram prefilled syringe or mini jet um, came onto the PBS. Um, and so what that meant is fundamental changes to the program. So the original um, five ampules in the ACT program, for example, they've all been replaced by the mini jet. Um, it makes it a hell of a lot easier to get access to. It also means that um, you know, we can start to explore intranasal administration um, through just simple application of a um, atomizer on the end of the mini jet. And it is worth pointing out now that a lot of other places are interested. So Queensland um, is is looking at setting up programs now um, after some presentations that took place at the winter school that John Strang was involved in, as well as myself. And now returning um, with very limited time to the question in Victoria. So basically, John Strang and um, others gave um, the presentations at a Centre for Research Excellence into Injecting Drug Use Colloquium. And during the process of, the, of this all coming together, we've come to realise that there's programs that are operating already in Victoria. So Harm Reduction Victoria already does um, overdose training and response and um, basically, at the end of the colloquium, everyone came to realise that there's really nothing stopping them from starting to um, distribute naloxone in Victoria. And so as a consequence, some health services and some treatment services have approached harm reduction in Victoria to um, commence um, the prescription um, process. And um, at the same time, um, there's the Annex um, is working to establish a community naloxone provision reference group that um, you know um, hopefully will be um, sort of set up to um, guide some of these processes along. Um, but in Victoria we actually have some unique opportunities. So um, we have the capacity for a more substantial evaluation than we've got in other in other parts of the country. So the uh, cohort that the cohort study that I lead, the Melbourne Injecting Drug User Cohort Study. Um, that, that comprises about 700 people. We'll be able to look at the people who are in the cohort who are trained versus those who aren't trained and seeing what sort of health outcomes they experience as well as what sort of experiences they have in administering naloxone to their peers. We have an ambulance attendance database and so um, we can easily track whether or not the, um, if naloxone goes out, whether or not that impacts on ambulance practice at all, whether or not the number of calls goes down. And we can also look at um, what happens when um, an ambulance arrives after the naloxone has been administered. Um, so, and the other things that we're planning on doing and um, we've, we're just going to ethics on doing all of this sort of stuff is because the Victorian situation, which I'll, um, which I'll, I'll talk about in a little bit more detail at the end, is, is different from the other states in that you know, people sort of realise that they don't have to wait for any program to be established or anything like that, they can just go and do it. That means that there's lots of different players, lots of different people who are already going and starting. And so we're, it's really important that we actually map what happens because otherwise things could um, quite easily get out of control. And so one of the key things we're trying to do is um, develop up a system to map um, the way in which um, this distribution evolves over time. The other things that we'll incorporate into the evaluation include 
um, you know, the, the things that have been done elsewhere. And the other thing that we'd like to do is to do some focus groups with other key stakeholders like police and so forth because, um, you know, in Vancouver, for example, it was the police who um, needed to be, ha there needed to be a lot of consultation with police in order to um, manage how they, um, you know, approach people who had naloxone because, you know, um, the, the, you know, you don't want people feeling as though they're going to get busted because they're carrying around this medication and so on. Um, so what's happened in Victoria? Well, as I said, after the colloquium, um, there was a lot of interest and um, in particular um, uh, um, some services who are kind of already involved in primary care um, for um, people who inject drugs um, made an approach to um, people at Home Reduction Victoria and I think it's um, um, great what happened because as a consequence of just only a few weeks, um, yesterday there was um, the first naloxone distribution for um, peer administration that took place in, in um, Melbourne and um, I think it was nine people who went through the course, is that right Jane? Nine people who went through the course that um, Harm Reduction Victoria developed in combination with, the, um, with Access Health down there in St Kilda and so it's up and running, it's happening. The barriers that people kept um, sort of envisaging around naloxone distribution really aren't there and um, you know, so as a consequence we've had some action which is fantastic. There's a website um, address up there for um, a Soros, oh, sorry not a Soros fan, a um, uh, Open Society Institute funded website which has an awful lot of detail about these programs that you can easily access and um, as I said everything at the moment is is basically free in relation to all of this stuff which is fantastic it's one um, you know no one's trying to patent anything or anything like that which is great um, and just before I finish up a blatant um, well, acknowledgements to um, the key players who've been involved um, especially Anna Olson who um, plays a central role in the evaluation of these programs in the country and just as a blatant plug for the drug trends conference which is happening here this is um, uh, something that happens typically in Sydney every year um, it's going to be in Melbourne this year and one of the key things that I'll be talking about when I um, uh, as, a, as a keynote speaker is what's actually happening in Victoria and so we should have a much better idea at that point in time what's going on with rela in relation to um, mapping out who's doing naloxone distribution as well as what's happening in relation to the reference group and so forth. Um, and also it's, it's going to be really interesting to hear what Chris Wilkins has to say about um, the New Zealand legislative responses around, um, around um, you know, emerging psychoactive substances uh, and I think, so I think it'll be a really interesting conference um, as well as Paul Griffiths who's um, a leading expert in the field. So that's it. Um, I'm sorry I've gone over time but I'd um, love to field questions and um, you know we've got key um, players in the audience so um, you know we'll be referring to them as appropriate.